Hi, everyone, and welcome to Wine.com Experiences. I'm Gwendolyn Osborne. We are so excited to have you here today with us talking about Francis Ford Coppola Winery and hopefully having a great conversation with um, the CEO and winemaking chief, Corey Beck, and of course, Francis Ford Coppola himself. Uh, we're also going to taste some wine. So thank you to all of you who submitted questions beforehand. Um, there were some great ones. We'll be including those in our conversation and hopefully get them all answered for you. If you purchase wines ahead of time, go ahead and get those open. Make sure your rosé is chilled. Um, get them in some glasses. Remember, you don't have to open all of them tonight if, if that's not possible. This video will live on on our wine.com YouTube channel and you can always return when you are tasting the others, whatever works best for you. The wines that we will be tasting in order are the Sophia Rosé, the Francis Ford Coppola Pinot Noir from Oregon, and the Director's Cut Cinema Red Blend. So those are the three wines. And now I would like to introduce our two guests. Uh, first, we have the CEO, and I love this title, Winemaking Chief, Corey Beck. Welcome, Corey. Hi, Corey. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having Great. us. Great. So glad you're here. Um, and of course, we also are going to introduce our the filmmaker, screenwriter, producer, and winery owner, Francis Ford Coppola. Hello, Francis. Hi, how are you? Hi. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for taking the time to come on and, and talk about these wines and the winery and just kind of have a conversation about um, the wine lifestyle and what you've done to promote it. Um, so I, I wanna start at the beginning because it's a very good place to start as we all say. Um, so let's go back to, to the beginning. You, you are a screenwriter and director and filmmaker but you kind of jumped into the wine business in the 1970s which was you know before it was common for many people in the film and music industry to kind of get on that, the venture into the wine world. What was, what was the catalyst that brought you to Napa to start all that? Well, of course, the Coppola uh, family is an Italian-American family. And uh, as a result, as a child, I, I never saw a dinner table that didn't have a glass of wine on it from my earliest recollection, uh, as my father uh, enjoyed uh, wine with food and my grandfather and all the relatives. In fact, even during the prohibition period, people uh, were allowed to make two barrels of wine in their homes for their own personal consumption. And uh, my grandfather did do that, and even though he lived in a tenement in New York. And my grandfather had seven sons, all my uncles. And, and, uh, and so I heard many, many funny stories about when the wine grapes would be shipped in. The kids, of course, fruit was like a rare, for a poor family, uh, fruit was a rare treat. And so they wanted to steal the grapes and they would lower the littlest uncle down in a rope down to where the grapes were kept and steal them and get in trouble. And it, it just sounded like so much fun that when I grew older and uh, had a home uh, and had two boys uh, living in San Francisco, I suggested, I said, let's buy a little cottage uh, in the Napa Valley, which is only an hour away. And the boys would be able to, you know, climb trees and have fun. But let's have an acre of grapes and then we can make our own wine. And so we, we came uh, with a uh, real estate agent to show us, you know, modest little uh, cottages, a summer house, you could say. <clears throat> but the, the agent very uh, fortuitously said to me, he says, you know, this isn't for you, but they're going to auction the great Nibam estate. And it's a chance to see it. It was once part of the beautiful Inglenook uh, state, which was the, uh, uh, the most beautiful wine estate uh, in the world, they said. And then there's a chance to just get a glimpse of it because you'll never have the chance again. So we said, oh, we want to see it. And indeed, when we drove there, it was, I felt like uh, uh, I was in a world that I had never seen before. It was so beautiful and so, it was an entire, a multi-thousand acre estate with uh, what could a lake and beautiful trees and vines. And I just, uh, I was bowled over and I did make an offer uh, for the auction and I didn't get it. <clears throat> and then having seen such a beautiful vision really, and you know, I was a poor kid. I was not 
used to uh, anything that you could call uh, in, in any degree wealth or, or opulence. And to see something like that was just more than I had ever uh, could imagine. And, and uh, so after we didn't get it, then I said, well, maybe we don't want just a little cottage. Maybe we want a more beautiful place like that. That was un incredible. And uh, so we looked at everything that was available and nothing compared to what we had seen. And and so I just sort of, uh, I was doing the preparation to go make Apocalypse Now and uh, was working on that and uh, sort of gave up this dream of a, of a winery. And then I heard, uh, I heard a rumor that the people who had won the auction, who did get it, uh, were going, the, were financed by a group that was going to build 60 homes on the mountain that came, that was behind it and where I am right now on that mountain and uh, they were going to build 60 60 acre uh homes and um wow. they they ran afoul uh of the of the agricultural preserve laws which wouldn't allow thank god the hills to have such development and uh so on a odd chance i went to the owner and i said well since you your finance partners can't build the these 60 homes might maybe they want to sell it and they said yes they do and I just was able to buy it. And then a month later, I went to make uh, uh, Apocalypse Now. And uh, uh, the second half of the story, shall I continue and show how I got yes, it? Yes, well, I want to know. So you, you have this property and then and then you start making wine, selling wine? Well, I, what happened is it, it came with about 100 acres of the, of, uh, in other words, it was not the whole of an Engel. Engelnook was much larger property at that time. This was... This was at what had remained in Gustav Niebaum, the founder's family. Hence, it was called the Niebaum estate. It was his home back in the turn of the century. And, uh, and so uh, came with it 100 prime acres of those grapes that had gone in to make the great Inglenooks. And my wife uh, was contacted by many, many people who came by and said, oh, we want to put a contract and buy those grapes. And, you know, they were 20-year contracts or 30-year contracts. And I sort of naively said, well, if they all think that the grapes are so good uh, and could make such great wine, why do we do it to anyone? Why don't we just make the wine ourselves? And she said to me, well, what do you know about how to make wine? I said, I don't know anything on how to make wine, but I don't know anything how to make movies either. And I made a movie that was so successful that we could buy this. So we just started to keep the grapes and, uh, and and make the wine. And that was around 1977, 78. The 77 I made uh, in the style of an Italian family with my mother and father and all my sons squishing the grapes and we made a 77. But then in 1978, we, we found a neighbor who wanted to be a winemaker and we went in to making a quality wine. And, and uh, that's how I got into the wine business. Well, that is fantastic. I'm a 77 vintage myself. So I love that that was your, your first vintage. So, um, um, but then, so, so that kind of grew, I think you, you, then you purchased something in 1995 and continued to grow. Well, I mean, there's a lot of stories in between, uh, including a bankruptcy. Uh, I, I had, oh, I, uh, this is another winery. This is in Geyserville. He's showing uh, you, the, yeah. but this is a later decision is that, mm -hmm. that when I, we were making a wine uh, which was the Coppola uh, Claret, which is still a, a wonderful uh, go-to wine that'll never let you down. Uh, you can trust and, and, and actually one of our most uh, uh, illustrious products. At any rate, I, I felt guilty that, you know, the Niebaum property had been such a great uh, symbol, Inglenook with a winery uh, founded over 140 years ago, you know, and, and then we were, I remember I had my various uh, movie awards there and people used to come and we were selling this bottle of, uh, of uh, Francis Coppola claret, which was really not uh, from the property's actual grapes. Um, and and I, I went through a period of like, well, you know, that was an icon. That was the thing. I don't want to have my Oscars there on display. And I someone had said that I had made it into a temple of my own career. And I got you being, uh, you know, I said, well, I, I didn't want to do that. I, I really admire the wonderful legend of the Napa Valley's great winery, Inglenook. And it was 
unfortunately destroyed by corporate interests that bought it and dismembered it. I don't want to just be the same as Ubline or those companies that did that. So I told all the people in our company, we were being very successful. I said, you know, I no longer want to sell anything that isn't actually grown on the property. And I don't want to uh, have my Oscars there. And I don't want to do anything that imposes me in front of the heritage of, of what had been the great winery Inglook. I didn't even own the name, uh, but I still respected it. And they said, you're crazy, Francis. You're doing really well. I said, oh, look, we'll buy another place somewhere and, and we'll sell those wines there. And and uh, and that was the photo that uh, they yeah, were so showing you. Uh, so this which is Sonoma, is, right? We were moving we, into we, Sonoma. We, we, start, we started a second winery uh, to make more popular, uh, you know, Inglenook was what's known as a luxury wine. It's, a, you know, few people, including me, couldn't really afford. That's like uh, drinking Chateau Lafitte or Chateau Margaux okay. or those great wines, which you can do maybe once a year or something, but who could afford to just have that as your home wine? So I... Whereas the Francis Coppola Claret is a, is a quality wine that you can enjoy more often because it's a, it's a, it's in that category and that's what this was in it had and we made a restaurant there and uh, many many happy evenings I can only tell you how and then I had this wacky idea I said you this know this is my favorite you, part so yes yeah, idea I, we had a fountain at Ingle Nook and I used to love to sit in the in the area and watch the kids play little they would sail little sailboats. In the fountain, but when it was hot, the kids would go in the fountain, and then people would say, "No, no, no, you can't." And the kids would say, "Why not?" And they said, "Well, because it's a fountain; it's not a swimming pool." And they said, "Well, why not?" And I thought, you know, whenever a kid tells me something, I listen doubly hard because kids speak right from their heart, and usually you should listen to them because there's great wisdom in what they say. So I said, "Well, I know winery has never done this before." but let's have a bunch of swimming pools at this new winery. So when the kids go visit with their kids, the kids can go, the kids can have fun swimming in the swimming pool. The parents can, can, and can go and, you know, taste wines and enjoy a wonderful meal with wine. And the grandparents, what do they want? They want to watch the kids. So the grandparents can watch the kids having fun in the pool. So the whole family can go and stay there all day. And that's what happened. Yes, and, and we as a family have done that. And I, I love it because I call it, it's a, to me, it's a lifestyle winery. You know, it's, yeah. it's a little bit of everything for yeah, everyone. But, but it was a wonderful thing because uh, uh, the folks could just, in, in space, they, they would call it a daycation. They're going to go have a daycation. I said, well, you're welcome to have it uh, uh, with us. And, and, you know, I'd always loved the park in Denmark, which is called Tivoli Garden. I, I, I went there and uh, got to see that once. And so I styled it a little bit, uh, almost like our version of a Tivoli garden. Well, it is, it's a beautiful place for those of you who have not been able to go. It's, it's lovely, it's one of my favorite places. I can't wait till it opens again um, to go. And the restaurant is fantastic, it's amazing food. I, I think it's gonna open in a few weeks as a matter of fact. Yeah. Okay, I'll see you so we were very We were very happy to learn that the COVID is not really readily transferable uh, in swimming pools because yeah. the chlorine, chlorine. Uh, finishes it off. Yeah, so, so that's, that's where I'm going to be spending most of my time. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. Well, you're welcome. Great. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so, so one question we got a lot from viewers that I want to ask before we start tasting the wines was just, do you see a link or what is the link that you see between the creative nature of making films and the creative nature that goes into making wine? Well, because they're all art forms. And, you know, one thing I've learned about the arts is that whatever it is, if it's a play, if it's a film, if it's making wine, if it's doing a musical show, if it's painting a painting, it seems to still always have three steps to the process. The first step is a gathering step where you gather the resources uh, that you that you need and it'd be gathering the grapes or Gary, uh, gathering the story uh, ideas and incidents that happen, but it's a gathering phase. The second uh, phase is the actual making where you take what you gathered and you you craft something beautiful out of it be it a play or a hotel. I mean, it's the same thing. You know, the, you know, a hotel, uh, you have uh, the same process. And then after the second phase, which is the making phase, 
Uh, and of course, uh, then you have the finishing and that's putting all the finishing touches on it. That's in the winemaking, you actually find it and put it in the bottle and give it its package and present it in a movie. It's the final step where you add the music and the stuff uh, that is the finishing parts, the color correction. If it's a play, it's the, the final tech rehearsals and any art has those phases. And so if it's an art form, it has these uh, the same technique of, of achieving it. Beautiful, and it is. These are, these are all these are all art forms. So um, well, I want to start tasting the wines. Um, some of we have a lot of people out there who have purchased them ahead of time. We're going to start with the rosé. Um, okay, so I love this picture. Uh, I know that uh, your rosé is named after your daughter Sophia. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the idea for for the wine, the rosé, Francis, and obviously. Well, I, 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 our family had all boys. My, as I told you, I had nine uncles. uncles. Uh, he had seven boys. My brother had all boys. My sister had all boys. And I had two boys. And I was sure that my third child was going to be a boy. Uh, but she surprised me, as Sophia always does. And I, I was blessed to have this precocious little girl, little Sophia. Uh, and, and she was always... Uh, she was always unique, this kid. She was always uh, funny, and uh, and uh, I used to, I had great fun, and I learned a lot from Sophia. And she always, as a child, had a uh, interest in fashion and stories, and uh, fantasy. And she was a good artist and a painter. And I used to tell her when she was about six or seven that one day. I was going to make a kind of sparkling wine for her and call the wine Sophia, and we would drink it at her wedding. And she was like eight, you know, so her wedding, <laughs> her wedding uh, hopefully was was not immediate. 20 years down the road. And, and I, I had, when I was in Paris, as I said, I didn't have a ton of money. And I used to enjoy with my wife, Eleanor, going to this little restaurant. There's always, when you live in Paris for a while, there's always a little restaurant that you uh, make your own. And we used to drink a Blanc de Blanc, which is a white of white grapes. Uh, that's fermented. So it's sort of, in a way, it's not champagne because champagne is a much more complex process, but it's a, it's a sparkling party wine. And we, we used to really enjoy it and we could afford it. And I thought, well, gee, maybe the public would love to have a Blanc de Blanc and we would call it um, Sophia. And, uh, and we, would, we, we would make it. And as I said, we would serve it at her wedding. And uh, it was just something you'd tell a little kid, you know, but I really did it, and uh, and that was the Sophia Blanc de Blanc, which is the uh, bottle with the pink uh, cellophane on it, and uh, and it was a popular wine, uh, and, and is a popular wine, and it was the very first wine that uh, when when people started to take champagne and serve it in small bottles, Pommery Pop was the first, and kids at nightclubs would have little uh, a glass. Straw. Uh, yeah, out of a straw. Uh, I asked Sophia, well, do you want to, when she was a bigger girl, and do you want to have uh, uh, the Sophia also in a small bottle? And she said she wants it to be in a small can, like a Japanese can uh, that she had seen. And so we were the, really, I think, the first winery to put wine in a can, and it was the Sophia, and she called it the Mini. And that Mini. was a very popular yeah. wine. Yeah. And then, of course, now we have uh, enlarged to all the wines and Sophia herself was a big girl and a mom herself and still as precocious as ever and a great a great talent and filmmaker we are all very proud of mm -hmm. uh, and she she helps us select the style of wine this is the the rosé and okay. can see it up here and I'm going to drink it because quite frankly it's refreshing and hot, hot day and this is refreshing Corey while while we're sipping this maybe um well first there's this Blanc Blanc my favorite thing is the pool too so you get to the pool and you get a bucket with the with the cans on it and it's the first thing you, you get to drink but um Corey could you tell us a little bit about kind of the intended style of this this dry rosé yeah good good question so a couple of funny stories uh, regarding the Sophia I want to uh, back up for a second so the first vintage of the Sophia Rosé was 2002, right? So we started off very early with the Rosé. And in fact, it was 100% Carneros Pinot Noir. At the time, Pinot Noir was long before the movie. So Pinot Noir, basically growers were bas giving it away. Getting rid of it, yeah. So we made it though in a, in a style that was a lot more red tone to it because the, the American consumer hadn't really kind of bit off on that salmon color um, quality. 
So we want we went to a little red, and then in recent years we've actually made it more of the salmon color, very dry, very fresh, very crisp. Uh, it no longer is 100% Pinot Noir. It is a little bit of Grenache, uh, Syrah, and, and a little bit of Pinot uh, in this case. But Definitely. like all of our wines, the what comes through is the acidity, the freshness, you know, not being sweet. Mm -hmm. um, so very perfect for summer. Yeah, I did kind of notice that. Just I've, I've had Sophia a few times in the past decade or even more, and it has evolved a little bit into a little bit more of that salmon color. And, and, that, and I enjoy them all, every every style, but that's... um. It does have that really fresh fruit characteristic coming through and it's just so refreshing. So we're also doing this wine, same wine in a can as well. Mm. So the cans came out with the, as Francis was saying, the Blanc de Blanc in 2004. So at the time, you know, we were, we were hoping that in, people would get into the can business because we were the only can on the shelf, right? So we wanted to create a set and uh, you know, it was one of those ones, be careful what you wish for, because now everybody's got cans. Um, yeah. but, but a very funny story with that, and, and I, I mean, Francis remembers, but we had the Sophia, the 1998 was the first one that we made for Sophia's wedding. We made a very small portion of it. And then some years later, in 2003, 2004, Francis sent myself and winemaker Scott McLeod at the time an email saying, hey, I'd like to put this product in a can. So Scott goes to me, he says, you know, send Francis an email back and tell him all the reasons that we can't do, it, you know, because of the, you know, it's not going to last and all the things nobody had put wine in the can before. So I send Francis the email, I type it, and about 30 seconds later, a minute later, I get a response. And there's one sentence that Francis wrote to us, it says, do not be the roadblock to creativity. <laughs> and that was, that was it. And so I was like, you know what, that was uh why can't you have wine in a can? And so here we are years later, we just actually installed a very large canning line at the winery. So can products are doing quite well. Perfect. Yes. I feel like I want that phrase on a, like a pillow, like too, like do not be the robot creativity. That's right. That's the right. It's great. Um, and, and Francis, I know you've, you've often named wines after family members to honor them. I know you have the, the Eleanor is a favorite. Some people uh, wrote in who registered of how much they enjoy that wine. I have a picture of my daughter, Eleanor, holding one of them. Um, wonderful wine. And then you also have the Archimedes, which is named well, after- Well, her. yeah, you know, it started because my mother, who's uh, was, uh, her name is Penino. Uh, we are the Coppolas and the Peninos, and they were both in the music business, so that there was a little competition between them and as to who, who was the creative influence on the kids, because all of our kids were, of the, had some talent in creative fields. And my mother said, oh, Coppola this and Coppola that. Never forget, you were a Panino. And uh, I realized that uh, she was feeling a little slighted with all of these Coppola wines and what have you. So we decided to make a company, a wine called Edizione Panino, which was a Zinfandel. And it actually was a wonderful Zinfandel and became quite a popular wine. So I began to realize that one way of handling the dynamics of a family and the hurt feelings and uh, the inevitable uh, uh, the inevitable tensions that you have between the people you love is to make products named and honoring them. So there was a Panino wine and then of course there's an Eleanor wine. And so I'm, I realized that there was a good, uh, a good approach is to turn your relatives into products and yeah. then uh, then the, they're and they'll love you forever and then they're honored and and uh, and it's sort of a, it's a commemorative of them yeah yeah no i think that's that's a wonderful thing there's a funny like. little sub note for musicians will appreciate because my family were all musicians on both sides but the Coppolas were in New York, and my father was the solo flute for Toscanini. And uh, we got a uh, we got a uh, a letter from one of the Panino relatives that says, "Oh, we have a young boy. He's a very talented pianist, and he goes and he plays the piano." There was a uh, our family owned a music store, and uh, we think that maybe one of your relatives in New York might be able to help him. Remember, he was a few years younger than me. And my father said, ah, what are you telling me? Every kid with short pants who plays the piano is a genius. Don't bother me. So he walked away and stuff. That little boy name is, uh, is Ricardo Muti. And he is one of the most acclaimed symphonic and opera conductors in the world today, who conducted at, uh, 
at La Scala and now is the musical director of Shark of uh, the, uh, concert in Chicago symphony, Ricardo Muti, and he is a Panino basically, he's a cousin. So the Paninos got the last laugh when it came to music at Glenn. <laughs> I like that. I like that story a lot. Um, um, so let's move on to the Pinot Noir because you, um, Francis, you, you decided to um, go into Oregon. Um, and it's exciting. It's a fairly new venture into the state. Um, so what we're tasting here is a diamond collection Pinot Noir, but I know you've purchased an estate there called Domaine de Broy. De Broy. De Broy. De Broy. Okay. Um, good old French name. Um, to kind of honor that you're going to be, you're working on producing the French varietals, the Burgundian, Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir. Um, I believe, is this the property here? Yeah, it's very beautiful. And of beautiful. course, De Broy, De Broy is, a, uh, is a name of royalty because he was a prince, a duke actually, and uh, the Duke De Broy. But I always loved the story of him because he was very shy and instead of just running around and terrorizing peasant girls and stuff, he was a scientist. And in fact, he was one of the leading contributors to, to the, the, the discovery and, and, and the very difficult, unique work in physics, in quantum physics. And he won the Nobel Prize. So I always loved this young prince who was one of the contributors who, who in fact, on the label, you see that he, his work of that matter at the most basic form was a form of energy wave waveforms, which is what the Broy's uh, contribution was. So to honor him, uh, I named uh, just as the great scientist Archimedes, who also was a family name. Archimedes, of course, was probably one of the the greatest scientific minds of the human race. Uh, uh, you could say, given uh, he lived 300 years BC, uh, and De Broglie was a contributor and won the Nobel Prize. But also, uh, I wanted to honor the Burgundian type wine because actually one of the first wines that I ever had that so-called knocked my socks off, you know, I had always had wine and as kids we drank it mixed with uh, uh, ginger ale or lemon soda, 7-Up. Uh, but, you know, when I first had like a great wine. It was an opportunity given to me to taste Chateau um, um, uh, Romani Conti. Romani wow. Conti is one of, as you, you can uh, better tell than I, one of the great Burgundies. And I drank this wine. I could not believe how delicious it was. I had never thought wine was delicious before. I thought it was interesting. And if you mix it with 7-Up and ginger ale, <laughs> almost it was as good as Coca-Cola. Of course, almost as good. I'm a little kid, so I should be forgiven. Uh, but but when I when I as a, as a, an adult or a 20 year old, I tasted uh, Romani Conti. I could not believe how delicious. And and there's a funny story is that I was in a uh, where I was up at the Bill Harris place uh, in uh, in Reno where he had this big car collection, and and I was there writing a script for some uh, actually for Bill Cosby who was the headliner at the time. And, and they taught me how to play Baccarat. And, I, and, I, and in those days, Black Baccarat was played with cash, $100. And I had $400. And I built it up, believe it or not, to $40,000. And I went out with the $40,000 and I bought $40,000 worth of Chateau uh, Romani Conti, which you couldn't do. In other words, you could buy one case of Romani Conti and then you had to buy with it two cases of Echazo and two cases of Richborg and two cases of uh, Grand Echazo and uh, and the various and there's nothing wrong with those wines. So no, I, no, I was gonna say that doesn't. So, suck, but... so I had to, I had all of this Romani Conti and I I drank it and uh, and uh, so I've always loved the great Burgundy and uh, and then when we began to realize that uh, that uh, thanks to the French who had. A French family who had, uh, I can't pronounce it, but it was Domaine Drouin. 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 The wonderful Drouin. family, and that they made a wine that was heavenly there. Mm -hmm. And so I was very attracted to that. In fact, our property, which is Domaine uh, de Broy, is right next right. to uh, that, that wonderful French family's wine. And this but wine yeah. is this this wine is also from Oregon, and I'm going to drink it with you because it's looking. I've talked myself into being uh, tantalized by it. 
Yes. Um, so Corey, tell us a little bit about this, because this is the Diamond Collection, and I know maybe you can tell us about what's to come maybe with, with Dubroy. But right now, what are we drinking? And we have uh, 43 acres up there, um, right in Dundee, in one of the premier spots of Oregon. Uh, this is a Oregon Pinot. We used a little bit of um, from our state fruit. And then just as we did when we came into Sonoma County, uh, by, we purchased a lot of fruit from growers up there. Right. So mm -hmm. a combination of our state plus some of the growers uh, in Willamette. And the funny thing about the, the net, you know, the net is part of our signature with the claret. And some years ago, Francis wanted to um, put the net on the claret. This was about 10 years ago. And he says, well, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of the um, wines in Spain that come from, that have a little bit of the, the net on it. And so we actually went over to Spain and he said, well, you should figure out how they get the net on it. So we went to a couple of bodegas over there and there's about five or six people in the, in the cellar that's hand tying and putting on the nets. And so I come back to Francis and Francis, you know, we, this is not going to work for us. <laughs> you know, he said, well, you know, you can find a machine. And, and you know, and that's one of the Francis's wills is like, we found a machine. We found a company in France in Bordeaux that builds one netting machine a year. And so we got on their list. And so now we actually own two netting machines. And so the netting is, uh, is part of the flagship within the diamond series. Good. Well, one, one year at a time, I guess, you have to get the netting machine. And, and you were not a roadblock to this creativity, right? No. Good. No. <laughs> so no. how do you think, uh, just tasting this, I mean, I, I love Oregon Pinot Noir. I think this is just a wonderful example of showing what Oregon terroir can do, but also, um, you know, at an affordable price, um, which, I, which I love. You know, the one thing about Oregon, which makes it so such a beautiful place is, is that, you know, not every vintage is, is a great vintage, right? Like mm -hmm. spectacular. Yeah. We have the vintages where it rains a bit. You know, we had 2019, 2018 were very good vintages, but it's the years that it rains a bit and you have to really work to make those, you know, charming pinots. And uh, that's the one thing that we're finding out. 19 was a, is a very good vintage. Uh, we did get some okay. rain during harvest, but the great thing about it is, is that when you're up there during harvest last year, middle of October, it was raining. Everybody was calm. You know, all the Oregon, they were just very calm. It's Oregon. Yeah. It was <laughs> all the time. California, it gets a little bit of rain in October and everybody's, oh boy, you got to get the grapes yeah. off the vine. And so it's very yeah. comforting yeah. to make wine up there. Yeah. My love is it has that kind of uh, like that slight earthy note. You know, I always kind of think of Oregon kind of as that in between the Burgundy and the California Pinot style. And it has that lovely kind of rustic earth note and then just the beautiful acidity that, that's coming through. So for the, the De Broy, um, will you be making both Pinot Noir and Chardonnay? Yes. Gordon, yes. A little, and, with a little bit of Pinot Gris that we're making as well. Oh, fantastic. Chardonnay, um, we actually have some stuff that we grafted over and the Chardonnays from up there are beautiful. Oh, I, I'm... Like if you're looking for that that burgundy, and I know that the Francis you're saying you're looking that your my magic moment was a white burgundy when I first had the wine that I said was delicious. So um, and I think Oregon does a phenomenal job with Chardonnay in that same same similar style, but still Oregon. What when, what is your vintage? What is your rollout? Kind of when can we look for having all these wines? Are some of them available now? Yeah, 2018. They're hitting. The, we're launching them right now. So and it's been nice too because you know. Tony Soder is up there, and he was a mm -hmm. consultant for Francis and Eleanor for years. Uh, Larry Stone is also making mm -hmm. wine up there, and he was, you know, part of Rubicon and part of the like. So it's been it's been great having a couple sounding boards as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I look forward to trying all of those. Sounds like there's more to come, um, and a wonderful investment. So let's move to the director's cut, which I think is just a favorite among many. Um, the label. I'll have mine. The label is, is fantastic. It goes all the way around the bottle. What was the um, kind of the idea behind this bottle design? Well, um, is that to me or to Corey? Oh well. I want it. Who who designed it? The idea is the zo <laughs> the zoetrope is a was the early toy that people used to have in their living room, and they would have it looked like a hat box mm -hmm. with splits, and they would put a strip. Uh, on it, and when they spun it around and peeked through the hole, it would look as though the little figures were moving, and it was a precursor of the movies, basically. So our film company was called Zoetrope, American Zoetrope, and I wanted to honor the 
movie business. And so the idea was to actually take a zoetrope strip and we have some authentic ones. I have a collection of uh, magic lanterns and early, uh, uh, early pre uh, movie uh, devices. And if we could take a strip and wrap it around the bottle and a number of our artists worked with uh, that concept uh, uh, and, and uh, the idea was, uh, but the problem was, how do you get it, the machine to do that? And we actually ourselves devised the machine as the bottling line comes, it wraps the label around, it slows everything down, but it's such a dramatic, um, such yeah. a dramatic uh, package that we wanted to do it. And that's how that happened. That's perfect. It's really beautiful. Um, so this is the Cinema's Blend. Um, uh, Corey, tell us a little bit about what's what's in this blend. It's from Sonoma. It's very affordable. It's easy drinking red wine. Um, tell us about just the grapes in here and kind of the the style goal. Well, one of the one of the things with our winery, which uh, which is kind of opposite of what a lot of wineries do, is is that typically a, a winemaker will walk through a, a vineyard and say, "Oh my gosh, this hillside Cabernet. We have to make a, a wine from this." And then the label is developed. In our, in our winery, the label's developed and then we go and make the wine from it, right? And so this is a great story where we had the, as Francis developed a label, called it Cinema and said, okay, so what, you know, how can we make this different? What would you like to do? And it was kind of when the red blends were just starting to, um, to move around. And we, um, we actually selected uh, Dry Creek. I, we love Dry Creek Zinfandel. It is just phenomenal. So we use um, about 50, 51% of Dry Creek Zinfandel. And then we use Alexander Valley Cabernet from uh, our estate and some of our different growers. So it really is a Zinfandel Cabernet. So you get a little bit of the spice um, character from the Zin, but then you get also that richness from the Cabernet. And, and it's, been, um, it's been a wonderful wine for us. And, and again, we, we sit right behind us is Dry Creek. And we're in Alexander Valley. So we're kind of on, on both sides of it. It's a, it's a lovely wine. Yeah. I, I, I love it. Um, my husband uh, blinded me on it the other day and I just was like, you don't know what it is. I just really like it. <laughs> so, but it does, it has that, that wonderful fruit spice, but then it has a little bit of structure and it's got all those big fruits. And um, I was, I was saying today to somebody, I said, it's, it's kind of that kind of wine that it just makes me feel like I'm at some sort of giant family dinner where everybody's laughing and telling old stories and you're passing the bottle after bottle round and staying up too late, but just having a great time. And you're not thinking too much. You're just enjoying each other and the food and the wine. And I, I don't know, that's just the kind of what this reminds me of. I, I, I confess that uh, the director's cut cinema is one of my favorite wines. It's uh, so it's a, it's not exactly inexpensive compared to like another wonderful value, which is the claret. But when I want to go for a little treat, I go uh, for the cinema. I reach for the cinema. Yeah, it's it's beautiful, it's, but it's still it's still affordable. It's still um, delicious. It would be great for summer and summer foods, barbecue. I just a little bit of of everything. I really enjoy it. Um, okay, the the one um, oh the car yeah okay. So we wanted to show, Corey. What are you sitting in front of? Let's talk a little bit about the museum. Yeah. So like I said, you have this lifestyle winery in Sonoma, which includes you know, an amazing restaurant, a pool, but you also have a museum, which is, is fascinating. Um, so what's the car? Either one of you, Corey, Francis. Ask the, well, well, made, ask the producer. We have some extraordinary things there. We have not only, when I vacated all of my awards out of uh, where they were, because I was embarrassed, we moved them all to this winery in, um, in Geyserville. And there are even wonderful props from, from Sophia's movies, of my, her, the boats from Marie Antoinette, which are large. Yeah, are there. that's right, the boats there. The and boats from Marie Antoinette there. The two boats from the, from the scene in Marie Antoinette. I had a big argument with people. They said, oh, it won't fit up there. I said, I bet you it'll fit. Let's <laughs> put them up and I'll show you they'll fit. And also uh, the costumes from Dracula, which are extraordinary <laughs> to see in real life. So that, that there's, and there's a lot of the, Props uh, from Apocalypse Now, the the actual PBR boat that the the, the sailors went up the river in is there, and the yeah, surf and the surfboards that they surfed in. Yeah, this is uh yeah it is again it's that whole you said daycation it's somewhere you can go to the pool to the restaurant to a museum um, play some bocce um, perfect. 
So I want to finish with um, talking a little bit about your spirits line. So I love the name. It's the Great Women Spirits. And, and what was your inspiration uh, behind this? Well, in truth, and this is, I swear to God, the truth, 10 years ago, I wanted to, I had read a book called uh, 12 Against the Gods by a man named William Bolitho. And it was a book about 10 great men who sort of took on uh, the, 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 the pressure and censure of, of, of believing things that were not popular at the time, you know, the greats who stood up. And I always wanted to do 12 women because, you know, despite the fact that men wrote the history, there were many women, we spoke, spoke of one, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who were truly as great as any man. I mean, there were, there were women in the field of science and of learning and of poetry and of painting, of all the fields who, who deserve to be celebrated as the geniuses they were. And some of them are even well known. I mean, I would say I, you, I can't make a, a, a spirit named after her because no one can copyright her name. But you know, Cleopatra was a genius. She lost the war. So the historians wrote that she was, you know, a seductress and stuff, but she was a brilliant, brilliant leader who was the first uh, Egyptian uh, ruler of, of the Ptolemies, because that was really a Greek family who took over, who could speak Egyptian. In fact, Cleopatra could be funny in 14 languages. She was an amazing woman, but there were many others, some of whom people don't know. Hippodia, who was a, a, a Greek uh, philosopher and astrophysicist, was a genius. She was right up there with the greatest Greek thinkers, uh, but because she was a woman, she didn't, I mean, now people know who she was, but she was, let me tell you, she was one of the great human beings in terms of the high level of contribution. And there were others. There was, there was um, uh, even in modern time, but there were the great uh, artists that was the Countess, uh, the Countess Lovelace, who was the daughter of Byron and who was, um, uh, the inventor of the, al of the algorithm and who's, who, who, because of her husband, uh, wealth, was able to sponsor Babbage, who made really the first computer. Babbage. Babbage the Babbage, Babbage yeah. uh, differential engine. So, yeah. so, I mean, the Countess Lovelace, so the, the, the Maria Waleska, uh, the great yeah, so too. Polish too. created woman. Um, yeah. Uh, these are one, I mean, these Eleanor are... of Aquitaine, Dorothy oh, Arzner, my own work teacher. on that, the Eleanor of was, Aquitaine. She was a, a film director during the Hollywood period. So I wanted to honor these women. And, and when we had the opportunity to have a spirits company, I said, let's do great women's spirits and let every, every bottle of whatever it is, be it gin, be it vodka, be it mm -hmm. uh, even tequila, one day made, of course, in tequila, be it bourbon, uh, let it honor these incredible women. Of course, now we're living in an era more in which the great women of our times are being celebrated. But this was an idea I had 10 years ago that, that I mean, I knew anyone who knows anything about history and literature knows that there were people who were, you know, I mean, if you were to name the five greatest American writers, Edith Wharton would be one of them. As would, several, as would several others. So, I mean, the contribution of women in science, in literature, in art, in philosophy, and everything is there shoulder to shoulder with men. It's just that they didn't get written up. Or they were, and they had to do it, you know, they said, well, you know, Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did, but she had to do it backwards and in high heels. These were women who were not allowed to have books, who had to figure out often uh, in, in go even into the convent where they would be allowed to study. Uh, they were not allowed to, to have the education that uh, is necessary if you're entering into these incredible fields. And, uh, and that's something, you know, obviously we could, we, even today, 50% of our population is not entitled to education. How absurd, because that 50% that if they were educated would be blessed we would be blessed with more geniuses. And we need all the geniuses we can get, the human race. We do. And, um, you know, I appreciate that as a, as, as a history major, 
and also as a um, mother of three daughters, um, that. And I, I kind of, I also just want to finish off and round up by something that, um, like I said, I was at the Wine Star Awards when you were there in January and gave it a magnificent speech. And you said, scientifically, we are all one family. It's outrageous that we should do anything other than celebrate one another. And I think that not only is that in wine, but I think that's just in human life. And I and, and, and even when you look quote. when you look at the present uh, news, which is of course split between the pandemic on one hand, uh, which is so serious, and which of course we will achieve, uh, we will rise above it as we always have, uh, and, and 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 the Black Lives Matters. Uh, uh, right. I mean, it's, it, it, it is too long to expect change in criminal justice and health equality and, and, and uh, um, education equality and child care and nutrition equality. And, you know, our, 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 our African-American co-American citizens, they made an enormous contribution, an economic contribution just in the arts. If, if I had a nickel for every dollar earned around the world for 300 years with art forms that were originated by the African-American citizens, the jazz and dance and stuff, it would be so much money that it could be paid as a royalty to, to adjust these, in, uh, these uh, because that's what it will take. It will take an investment in money to adjust criminal justice, to adjust education disparity, to adjust health disparity and to adjust poverty, which, 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 which hurts the children. If the children don't get proper food to eat and, and schooling, how can they grow to be the geniuses that they will uh, result in? So, so I feel that these current themes all can be resolved, understanding that we are a family, we are a human family, and, and we are uh, jointly uh, connected and, and, and what is good for part of our family is good for us. And that's, uh, that's you know, what I believe. And, uh, and I feel it's not as if our, our fellow American citizens didn't make a contribution. They made a great contribution. They just weren't rewarded for it. It was, it was a royalty never paid. Well, I'm going to end on that because we, I think that you, you're right. Just, we should be celebrating each other. We should be um, honoring each other. And I feel like that is what you do with your wine. Um, it's this amazing line of wines that ranges from, you know, every day to collectible, but I, you have this passion for, for family, for honoring family and people who have made contributions. And it, it also shows quality at every level. So, so thank you for doing well, I that. will drink a toast to that, to the human family. May it, may it prosper, may it be happy, and maybe may it enjoy each other because the secret of life is not how much money you're worth, it's how, how good your friends love you and how you love your friends. So I drink to that. Well, I will drink to that too. Thank you again both for joining us. Thank you all at home for joining us. We hope you enjoyed, learned, and this was a wonderful conversation. So cheers to you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Corey. Cheers. Cheers. It's both a science and a form of high art. It's made from the combination of grapes, sunlight, rain, soil, and time. It's raised up in the moments that matter. It's wine. And we are wine.com. We have the largest wine selection in the world, online sommeliers with free advice. And now, our powerful new app puts the entire world of wine in your hands. Wine.com. Seriously passionate about wine. Download our free app today.